GM, GM, welcome everyone. How we doing today? That was weak, that was weak. How we doing today? There we go, there we go. Get the energy up, because we have a very, very special panel with Christie's. I'm super excited. As you probably saw, we have the honor of the global premiere exhibition of Keith Haring's Pixel Pioneer, uh, Christie's auction of five pieces, digital drawings that he did with an Amiga computer in the 80s. This is a very, very, very big deal. And uh, we're so excited to have an amazing panel here. Um, I'm just gonna pass it around to our incredible panelists for brief intros. Um, just, just give a brief intro and then we can dive into the, uh, into the details. Let's get it. DK, you wanna start? Hi. Um GM, um, my name's DK, and um, I'm an animator from South Korea here, and I'm based in US, and I'm known for 2D animation. I make a lot of cute things and make them move, so yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all. Hello everyone, I'm Nicole. I am, uh, I run digital art sales and NFTs at Christie's um, and super excited to be here. This is our third time working with NFT Now and The Gateway and we're, yeah, super pumped to be showing the exhibition of Keith Haring, Pixel Pioneer for the first time globally here. Um, so yeah, excited to get, dive into this panel and, and talk more about the auction. Woo! Hi, this is Yuna. Um, I am the senior specialist of um, Christie's Hong Kong. The senior doesn't mean I'm old. <laughs> I am more experienced, I hope. So I'm really great to be here today. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Well, we're really happy to have you. You know, why don't we start with you? I would just love to hear, set the stage a little bit about Keith Haring's history, about his legacy and, and what he's known for. Yeah, I think you guys already know him so much, you know, and uh, so I would just briefly want to mention three points because how much his art is innovative and unique and symbolic. The first of all, his, his art is really, you know, the achieved innovation because when he came to New York 1978 and he actually wanted to be the, you know, the artist. And then when he see this New York street, he was, you know, really becoming very innovative and then just the paint. It's not just canvas and oil, but he sometimes he used just, the, you know, the charcoal or whatever he can use. So he just start painting, you know, the street and also the metro and everywhere. So with the Basquiat and he, you know, actually developed this graphic, you know, street art. So that's his very innovative part and also you know, he break down the boundary between low and, you know, high culture. So as, you know, Andy Warhol and all these pop artists did, I think he also made, you know, huge um, step to break down what's, you know, high and what's low. And also, um, as just I briefly mentioned, he used this whatever material he can use, he can paint. So he break down, you know, the con conservative idea of the painting. So usually we say painting means canvas or paper, but he used street wall and just, you know, the graffiti anywhere. So that's his innovation. And also I was very fascinated to learn because, you know, um, I thought I'm very experienced um, specialist, but I didn't know he actually produced, created digital art in 1985 using Amiga computer. And then I told Nicole how much I was fascinated, you know, to learn this new, uh, new thing about uh, Kiss Herring. So that's also, you know, can add more part of how much he was innovative. Yeah, so I think, he, you can say he's a pioneer of digital art in that point. So he's very in innovative and also the uniqueness is, as you can see, he, he just um, create very unique icon. That is also amazing part of him because, you know, as a hobby, I paint by myself. <laughs> very horrible. <laughs> so 
theory and creative, you know, the production is totally different, I learned. And then, because I always thought I can be a master, but then that was wrong idea. So he created his own unique icon and that also has, a, the third part of his, you know, amazing thing is, it's not only icon, but it has all meaning because, you know, as you all know, he was the, uh, you know, the homosexual artist and then he was very openly gay. And then um, at that time, actually AIDS, you know, HIV was known to the world in 1981. And then it became huge, you know, social issue and problem, but then no one actually wanted to talk about it. But Keith Haring was very brave and he you know, delivered the message very actively, proactively, and through his very you know, like, um, delightful icon and very colorful painting. So it, visually it looks very light and then fun, but then it has you know, the really deep meaning. You know why we has we have to take care of the social issues and what we face now. So I think his art is amazing for that three points largely, like very you know innovative, unique, and it has a symbolic meaning. And then everyone who knows art or not, even like serious art collector, they love him. But then you know very young children also can love you know his art. So that's also a great part of you know. Uh, his art, I think. Th thank you so much for that great explanation. Everybody give it up for Yuna. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That was amazing and incredibly informative. Thank you. DK, I'd love to go to you next. Um, as a successful artist working in the Web3 space, I'm curious, like, you know, what role has Keith Haring played as an inspiration? What are your thoughts on his legacy as you think about contemporary art and, and uh, this, like, entering the digital space? Um... Yeah, so uh, as an artist, I, am, I have tremendous respect for Keith Haring and his passion to art and his desire to bring his art to uh, great masses, um, making, it all, making it very accessible to everyone. I think that really, really resonates with me on a di different level because that's exactly what I'm trying to do as well. And, I believe we share a lot of similarities in terms of art style as well as the uh, philosophy. And my philosophy in art is that uh, I always say that um, art should not be difficult and it should be something tangible, relatable, and shareable with absolutely everyone. And you know, no boundaries, uh, no matter what you are, no matter uh, what status you have, no way, no. Uh, all, all ages and no, you know, doesn't matter, no limitations. So I believe art is that, uh, art is self, I mean, the universal expression, if you think about it. So it's, it's, it's the only thing that really connects us all together. Even it goes beyond like the language barriers and also uh, the cultural differences. And I, I don't know if he was thinking that deeply, but I believe he was doing it in a way that he has, he has been influencing it that way, that, you know, with his art, like, we were all able to connect together, you know, in some different way, so that was very inspiring for me, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, if, if, I, if I keep thinking about Keith Haring, like, like you and I just mentioned, um, he literally broke the, the boundaries between the high art and the low art, and, that's also exactly what I want to do as well. And I believe he's like, he's like the first one and the best yet as well to do so. And it's amazing. And I feel like even though they're not here with us anymore, but I feel like I am continuing their legacy through my art. And I think it's really great. Um, and also like if he, were, he were, if he was alive today, I think um, he would have adapted to the digital art perfectly. Uh, as well as the uh, NFTs and the blockchain technology. And if he was around, maybe, um, I don't know, like, I think I would have gotten like really along with him because we share so much similarities that, um, yeah. And it's really, it's truly inspiring. And 
Yep, and that's it. I love that. No, thank you for that insight. And I think that touches well on something I wanted to talk to you, Nicole, about, um, which is I know that the, the foundation feels and many feel that, that he would have really embraced the space, right? That if, if Keith were alive today, um, he would have embraced the Web3 space and digital and digital art. And I'd love to hear your perspective there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think so. Uh, Christie's, we've been working with the Keith Haring Foundation for a little over a year now on this project. And uh, Gil Vasquez, who's the director of the Haring Foundation, really, really does believe, and who was a very close friend of, of Keith um, in the 80s as well. That's how he's um, taken on this role. But uh, he, he definitely believes, just as what Matt and DK, you just said, that he would absolutely be embracing the Web3 community and the uh, vibe of this whole sort of space today, um, hands down. I think not only from the from the technological aspects, like he was a very innovative, as you know, outlined earlier. So, so yes, from the technical side, like I think he would be experimenting, and continuing to experiment and push the boundaries of digital art from a, from a technical perspective, um, just like he did in the 80s. But I also think just from a community perspective and from the idea that he was a huge proponent of art for the masses, art is for everyone. Um, there's, a, there's actually, as an aside, there's a big um, Keith Haring retrospective right now in Los Angeles. Um, and the big motto for the exhibition is art is for everyone. That's, that's plastered all over the road in, in LA. And um, so it was really his motto. And I think that's exactly what a lot of the artists like DK and a lot of the artists in this space are trying to do. Um, and I think what we're trying to do at Christie's as well is bridge the gap between the traditional art collectors and um, through educational programming and uh, you know trying to educate our traditional collectors into the digital art space um, and vice versa. So I think, um, I think Keith would have been hopping around all these parties and going from conference to conference and he would have been a good friend. I love that. I love that. And it's such an honor to really have to have Keith's work here at the Gateway. It's been the hardest thing for me to keep secret. <laughs> I tell you, because we've been, we've been working on this for months and, and, and we had a very strict embargo and I just had to keep my mouth shut, which I'm not very good at, but I was, I, I was good on you, it. The, you abided by that. Thank I you. I abided by it, but I was so excited. As soon as that embargo was lifted, I couldn't wait to tell the world. Um, we gotta dive into the backstory. Like, how did you make this happen? It's really special and really significant. Yeah, thank you. So in 2021, we did um, a somewhat similar project with the Andy Warhol estate. So Andy Warhol and Keith Haring together were experimenting with digital art in the 80s um, on both Commodore Amiga computers as well as an early Mac computer. So they met Steve Jobs actually in the 80s and Steve gave them both computers and said, what do you think of this? You know, I really want my computer to be, um, you know, useful for artists and designers. And so he gave out computers um, to a lot of these artists. So there's actually some really awesome footage um, on our website. You can check it out of, of Steve showing Keith and Andy the computer and them kind of looking and, and working on it. Um, and there's some cool diaries that we were reading through of, of Warhol, um, you know, talking to Keith and saying, oh my God, I just drew a circle on the computer. How crazy is that? And so it's, uh, it's been really fun to kind of like look through that. Um, and so yeah, so we did that sale with Andy, with the Andy Warhol Foundation, so in 2021. So on the heels of that, um, you know, through our research and working with them, we, we realized that both Andy and Keith did these, the, this art together. So um, we uh, had been, Keith Haring Foundation, we, you know, we obviously at Christie's have a good relationship with them, just um, holistically for his, his traditional art um, works that we partner with. Um, so we worked with them and, and brought the idea and they were incredibly um, enthusiastic. Um, obviously wanted to do it right. And a couple of things that we actually learned from the Warhol sale, um, you know, I think it was pretty early when we did that one in 2021. It was May of 2021. So that was right when things were starting to, right when things like really, you know, heated up in the, in the space, I'd say. So we were moving really fast and we had a lot of um, things that we learned from that sale. One of which was the on-chain technical aspects of the work. So I think... For this sale, we, we worked with the Herring Foundation and a group called Digital Practice that worked with the foundation to put all of the files um, on chain. So the original files are PICT, and I hope I get this right, so um, I'm, I'm not the most technical person, but you, someone can call me out if I'm wrong. But So the original files are PICT. Those were the files that were extracted from the floppy disks that were um, S 
you know, found in, from in Keith Haring's collection. Uh, then those were converted into PNG files, um, also minted on chain. And then the PNG files um, are then converted into SVG files, which allow them to be blown up and to still keep the ratios the same and the high resolution. Um, so the, the technical aspect is incredibly detailed. Um, and there's a huge like three page document on the tech that's on our website if you are interested and want to check it out. But um, I think it's really amazing that these works were done digitally. They're preserved. This is not a copy of the original files that are minted on chain. These are the actual this is the actual artwork um, that is stored on chain and will now be preserved uh, for collectors going forward. Amazing. Amazing. I love that. I love like kind of thinking about that moment of like Andy first using the computer of Keith, like discovering this new medium. DK, I'd love to hear from your perspective, like take us to that moment for you. Like when did you first start using a computer to make art? What was that like? And how has that evolved to your present day practice? Um, you know, uh, as a kid, I would always draw doodles, you know, and I, back in the day, like, I would draw doodles and thinking that these are just doodles. I wouldn't really treat them as art. And after, like, high school, when I got into a college, I was introduced to, like, all different softwares such as Photoshop, Illustrator, and even the 3D programs such as uh, Maya or the Cinema 4D and stuff. And, you know, I was trying all different softwares, and I was just always fascinated having a work digitally produced through computer. And um, at the time, I didn't even think of it as an art. At, at that instant, it was just, oh, this is so fun. This is, this is very, very fun. I just wanted to do it more. And without even realizing what it was exactly, I would just keep doing it because it was so fun. And eventually, I figured that, uh, you know, there's a whole career about it. There's a graphic designer, motion graphics, animator, and all that. And then, you know, I slowly fell in love with uh, animation. And I've been doing digitally ever since. Like, I still doodle sometimes with pencil here and there, but most of my works are done like digitally. And um, like now, a person like me, as a contemporary artist, like I wouldn't know like what to do without digital at this point. So that's how uh, that's how um, embedded in me, how serious, how deep embedded in me the digital art is. I love that. And for those who may not know DK's work, you can check out his piece, I Love Korea, on display here at the Gateway. We're so happy to have you. And I love how you describe having fun because that, that spirit really comes through through your work. That's really, really fun to experience as well. 100%. It's, uh, you know, when you have fun, it's, you do it without even really thinking about it. You, you, you do it because you're, when you're having fun, you're able to keep doing it. And that keep doing it is eventually a practice. And that practice is gonna lead you to be a professional somehow. And when you're a professional, the path just creates its own way. So that's exactly what happened to me. So, yeah. I love that, I love that. Yuna, I would love to get your perspective as an expert in the art, in the art world, based here in the Asian region. What are your thoughts on the Korean market, um, you know, here and, and uh, in Asia uh, overall? It seems like there's a big growing market for contemporary art. Yes, uh, um, as you know already, um, the Asian market in general is growing rapidly. So now actually I, I belong to Christie's Hong Kong and then we um, hear that the importance of the Asian market and now actually in Hong Kong we moved to Henderson building as designed by Zaha Hadid and then because we used to have an auction at the convention center twice, you know, twice a year. But then now once we move to new venue, then we can have all year or the much more work for us. But so that much we put importance on the market and we invest in an Asian market. So and also Korea market, as you can feel, it's growing really fast and then uh, the last year for the first time, the auction turnover, we actually entered the top 10 country. Yeah, 
So we never been top 10 country, you know, never. But then last year, we the sale was really good and the market was growing really fast. And then especially Korean people, I believe, have a very good sense for the uh, contemporary art and then they lead the market. So now even some big collectors say if Korean collector liked some artists, it can make it. So they trying to see and observe what's going on in contemporary art scene. And um, I'm not the NFT expert at all, but I just uh, want to let you know, let me ask you, do you, can you guess how much was the auction record for the Kiss Herring work at the auction? Auction record? You're not gonna spend your own money, so guess. <laughs> <laughs> Any guesses? Any guesses out there? The auction record for Kiss Herring, the painting. The highest price that anyone has ever paid for a Keith Haring work of art. $69 million. $69 million. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> but actually, it's a one tenth. So uh, it's about six million, yeah, six million US dollars. That's the uh, highest auction record. So I think this NFT is really big bargain. <laughs> I mean, considering the importance, you know, historical importance and everything. So I hope you can beat. <laughs> yeah, and I will, I'll just add, I think, you know, if you believe that digital art, and I think we all do, that's why we're here, if you believe digital art is, you know, uh, going to stick around and, and be really important, you know, as art history continues to evolve, um, these are five unique pieces by Keith Haring, and he's not making any more, so. You know, I think it's it's a really amazing thing to add to a collection. Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, Nicole, I'd also love to hear your perspective. I know that um, each of the pieces, I think, is the estimates uh, are, are priced between 200K and, and 500K with, I think it was 1.65 in total. How do you reach those estimates? Kind of like, what is that process like for, for judging and appraising, uh, you know, a unique set of works like this? Yeah, so I think... It's difficult, it's not a perfect science. Uh, definitely it's an art. Uh, we looked at Keith Haring's market for prints um, as well as unique paintings um, and also a combination of the current digital art market today. Um, and we also looked at how the Warhol works did in 2021, which was definitely the height of the market as I said. So the Warhol works each made around a million dollars. So considering that, um, you know, I, I think that these are, personally, I think Keith Haring's aesthetic translates better to the digital aesthetic than Warhol's did. I think Keith is uh, naturally more animated, it's more 2D, it, 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 feels, um, it, it, it just feels more tactile when you're looking at, at a Keith Haring work digitally than, than Warhol's did. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, I, I think we're, uh, the market has stabilized a bit since then, so um, we want it to be conservative estimates um, because I think these are pretty accessible, so um, yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, DK, I'd love to hear your perspective too. As a, as a Korean artist who is, well, who is very active in, in Web3, what are you seeing from, from the Korean market? Um, you know, in terms of, we talked about the contemporary art world, the traditional art world, but like, what, 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 are, sort of, what are you seeing from Korean artists in Web3? Um, one thing I noticed is that, um, well, for those who are in Web3, uh, the Korean artists, I think they have pretty decent idea, you know, how the future is going to look like. But those who are not in the Web3, there's so many talented and amazing artists that they don't really realize that they are artists. Because the way they make a living is through, you know, they do a lot of amazing digital art, but then, the, you know, their end goal is pretty much the same. It's, 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 but it's, it's to go to, uh, you know, one of the big name corporate companies and work there as a, as a office something or designer or you know, animator. But you know, digital art can be something more bigger than that. And that web, through Web3 actually, so I don't, right now not many people so realize it, but I wish that you know, slowly once this uh, Web3 becomes more broader and more mainstream, um, I, I wish that um, those artists can actually believe that they can be something bigger and they can actually acknowledge that they're an artist. And as a, as a Korean who is very active in the Web3, um, I want to lead that, you know, I want to inspire many and 
I would like to show them that you know this isn't the only way. There are many possibilities that that you could do, and hopefully, um, hopefully we get there soon. I love that. I love that perspective. Um, I have a question for for Nicole and for Yuna, if you'd like. Um, Obviously, Christie's really has been at the forefront of bringing the, uh, this, this space, the NFT space, the Web3 space into the art world, the traditional art world, dating back, obviously, to the landmark Beeple sale, the early CryptoPunks auction, and, and then the launch of Christie's 3.0, all of this. Um, what are you seeing? What are each of you seeing in terms of the traditional art markets and the traditional art world's stance on digital art and, and this space? Like, are you seeing an evolution in uh, understanding or acceptance? Yeah, uh, I think it's, to be quite honest, I think it's slower than I would have, ho would have hoped and what I probably would have thought in 2021, to be honest. Um, but yes, absolutely. I mean, every every new project, every new sale that we do, we, you know, grab the attention of another traditional art collector. Um, so yes, I think we're, it's slowly permeating. And I was also, I was walking through Freeze yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Um, and there were a lot of digital art uh, works in, in booths. Um, I will say not, I don't, I don't think any of them were minted as NFTs, but there were there was a lot of digital art, actually. Um, and so I think that's another interesting point because digital art has existed since the 60s. It's just another medium for artists to create art, right? There's painting, there's sculpture, there's, there, and then there's digital. Um, but I think the, the Web3 element of it is the, is the new part, new-ish part, um, that I think is still um, being adopted. But digital art, you know, is, is definitely uh, at the forefront of contemporary art for sure. Very good. Yuna, did you have any thoughts on that as well? Well, um, I'm just um, as a specialist for 20 and 21st century art, I believe, I mean, the most um, items I'm selling now is painting or the, you know, the traditional sculpture. But I do really believe, you know, the lesson from art history is you have to be innovative all the time. So that means, you know, I think the digital art, the portion of digital art will getting bigger and bigger, I believe. And, it may, you know, no matter it takes time or not. So um, I think you need to prepare. And for myself, I trying to learn about NFT and what's going on in digital art. And so um, I tell also my clients that um, I, now maybe you, you, can, you don't really feel like buying, but you really have to trying to understand what's going on and because maybe it's the future. And, but I don't think that traditional art medium will disappear because of NFT because, you know, when, you know, usually new technology comes and people say, oh, okay, so now there is TV, so radio will, you know, <laughs> die, but then that never happened. So I think, well, same situation. So traditional art will be there as, it, as they they are, but I think the digital are also um, take more bigger portion in the future. I completely agree. I think that's completely spot on. You know, the, the gateway was actually born from this idea that we had that, that we are all part of the last generations to grow up without without digital ownership from day one. So future generations are gonna grow up owning things digitally, owning things physically, and accepting them both for their own unique strengths and appeals, not necessarily having the same hangups as we do with how do I hang it on my wall or right click save. They're just, and the idea is that it's always an and, not an or. People are still gonna need amazing paintings and sculptures for their home, and they're also gonna have incredible digital art to show in their metaverse galleries or perhaps on their screens and the like. Um, DK, I'd love to hear your perspective perspective as an artist at the forefront here um, like what you know in thinking about we talked about traditional collectors you know kind of coming into the space trying to understand this a bit better talk, tell us a little bit about your collector base and how you've built a collector base that is that is very much plugged into what you're doing digitally um, so normally I think um, what I'm gonna say is gonna be very relatable to many artists I believe it's very artists don't really don't know how to communicate with collectors at first. And, um, and if we think about collectors and their status or what their job is, like it's totally different from what, what artists do. And there are actually no connections that we can actually uh, make in the real world. So 
when there's an auction and then collectors decided to bid on one of the piece and then that's how the connection begins, right? And then we say thank you to the collector and the collector will say, oh, I love your honor, et cetera. And then that's how the conversation begins. And if you think about it, it's, it's such a beautiful thing because we're so different, but then at the same time, we share the same, um, the love for the art that it kind of connects. We have like such a different uh, background, lifestyle, but through art, like we are able to make a connection. And then not everyone, but um, most of the collectors are, you know, really interested in our art, uh, artists and they want, they really want to know and they want to be friends and they want to like help the sport. And it's such a great feeling. And coming from a corporate world where I was uh, just a regular designer and animator, um, we get none of that actually. I just do work that I'm told to do and I get paid by uh, uh, monthly and that was the rewards. But you know, in Web3, when I meet uh, collectors, of course the, I get the money if I get to sell my piece, but more than that, I get to build a relationship that I never ex thought that it, you know, it was possible. And also I get to connect with other artists and then be part of that community. It's such an amazing feeling. I love that. I love that. Nicole, I'd love to get your perspective. I mean, as we said, we've been fortunate enough to partner together for three years now. This is the third gateway we've done together, which is really, really special, dating back to uh, December 2021, when we were just a six-month-old startup. And um, partnering with a, a storied auction house like Christie's was obviously a very big deal. And so it's been amazing to, to see this partnership and to grow together. Um, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on kind of this moment moment because, you know, this is the first time that Free, uh, Free Soul has happened at the same time as Korea Blockchain Week, as well as Soul Fashion Week, kind of bringing this like crypto world and also the culture, the cultural world together for this kind of unique moment and why it was important to, to you know, kind of be a part of this. Yeah, well, first of all, we love working with you guys, so thank you for your continued support. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think as we continue to try to blend these two worlds, moments across the globe where crypto type conferences are coinciding with traditional art events and weeks are the perfect opportunity for Christie's to, to you know, uh, bring digital art from our platform uh, to that location. I think it's, it's the right Venn diagram, right, of, of potential clients, of artists, of like-minded people, smart people that, you know, we can all learn from and, and hopefully kind of come away from the week and have some great ideas and new partnership ideas coming out, which I think I already have many, so thanks to the many conversations that we've had the past few days. Um, but th those, are, those are really the opportunities that we look for. So um, even Miami Basel, which was the first one that we did, um, I think there was a crypto conference also at that same time. D Decrypt or something, if I remember correctly? Something, no, D Decentral. C Central. Yeah, yeah, Decentral, yeah. yeah. They all start to blur together, but you know. Fact. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean that's that's um, that's really what, what we're looking for. I think it's it's a no brainer to for us to to be part of this this time in Korea. Uh, also selfishly, I've never been here, so I, you know, love to come. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yuna, I'd love to hear your perspective too on this week. You know, with Free Soul and everything in the traditional art world, like what are you seeing that is exciting or inspiring? Well, now I think it reminds me of, you know, a few years ago, uh, what happened to Hong Kong market, because now, you know, the biggest mega galleries are here, the White Cube and the like Gagosian, they just announced hire the director in Seoul and also many other, like Pace was, you know, has been here a long time, Lima, Murphy, you know, all those, these big names, you know, opening the gallery here. So it's very exciting because I think the Korean collectors, they can actually have more like broad, you know, the uh, understanding of a global market. And so I think, uh, I, I mean, it's been growing really rapidly I, and I hope that it will grow um, further. And I actually see many potential to grow more because during last two, two three years during the COVID and the, the, I think the Korea really developed very big pool of, art, you know, the buyers. So it doesn't matter how much, you know, the 
high value, low value, I think it doesn't matter because I think it really important matters is they love art and then they just to start making their own collection. So, and then I also, the, the very bright side is they're a very young generation. They, uh, they have, you know, big, uh, the love on the art and then they, they are actually interested in NFT and also the traditional art at the same time. So yeah, I think it will grow much more. Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you for sharing those insights. DK, I know you also have your own exhibition, right? A solo exhibition is in Jongro, Jongno? Yes, that's correct. Tell us a little bit about that and uh, the vision. I know you said you poured your, your heart and soul into it, yeah? Yes, so um, me and my team, um, we, uh, we've been preparing this for like several months and we found a great place, uh, this place called Hiker Ground. Um, it's, at, it's at Jongno and it's nearby Gwangamun. And um, it's actually not Web3 related. And the reason why I chose that place is because uh, I wanted to expand my art, not just within the communi uh, Web3 community. I know that you know Web3 is gonna be the future and I totally have the commitment to, to be active on it. But at the same time, at this moment, um, during this bear market, um, majority of people are not really aware of this Web3 space. So I wanted to um, expand my art to regular people and just to make them enjoy my art and let them know that I exist. And yeah, so um, it, it turned out really great and I'm really proud of it. And this is my first exhibition in Korea. And so if you guys have time, um, please come visit. And if you run into me, say hi, and I will say hi back. And thank you, yeah. Amazing, where, where is it so people can, uh, can find it's, it? Uh, it's at, I don't know the exact address, but then if you type in hiker ground, it will show up right away. It's H-I-K-E-R and ground. So it's, it's gonna show up right away, yeah. It's, Amazing, amazing. Nicole, I'd love to return to the herring auction quickly because, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, when, when we did the announcement, we saw just like all sorts of excitement on the, across the socials, all sorts of, wow, I didn't even know this existed, all of that. And I know that you went through, as you mentioned, the Andy Warhol uh, sale and, and that probably, you know, prepared you in some ways for, for this. I'm curious, like, what were some of like the lessons learned that you were able to apply in this context? And are there any other amazing artists who have made things digitally we should know about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so lessons learned, I think. Well, the biggest one was the one I mentioned earlier. Um, the, for the very technical um, purists, I would say, um, we were really, it was really important for us to be able to put the original files that Keep did on chain. Um, so this this company, Digital Practices, takes you know gets all the credit for for this. Um, they they really worked with the files, you know, extracting them from the floppy disk. Um, so I mean, just to go back slightly. So I guess how we realize that these even exist. Um, so Timothy Leary, who is a psychologist and turned sort of New York City it man um, in the eighties, uh, kind of knew everyone from Yoko Ono to Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, Basquiat, the whole crew. Um, he, get, he was the one that gifted the Commodore Amiga computer, uh, who was, he was working on some game at the time, um, like the first ever kind of computer game, gave these computers to both Andy Warhol, gave one to Andy Warhol and one to Keith Haring. Um, and then Keith did these works of art, you know, digitally on the computer, put them on a floppy disk, I guess, downloaded it onto a floppy disk, then mailed the floppy disk to Timothy Leary. Um, and then Timothy Leary, when he died, his collection of stuff, his papers, his diaries, his things that he owned, including this floppy disk, were given to the New York Public Library um, in their permanent collection. Um, then when they were sifting through this, they found these works, and the Keith Haring Foundation, um, being the foundation, uh, you know, owns the rights to all uh, IP and, and imagery that Keith Haring has done. Um, so then they, using that floppy disk, this company Digital Practice worked with the foundation to extract those files um, in a beautiful way that the, like I said before, the original files are actually on chain. Um, whereas the Warhol ones, it was, it was the original, actual original file was too, it was too small. It was a TIFF file, I think. They were too small to be on chain at the time. And there was no real digital company that knew how to 
kind of convert that to a bigger file that you can even view um, as a piece of art and also keep it on chain. So um, that was the biggest lesson learned, I think, uh, in, in this, in this um, project. Um, and then I think, you know, also what worked well in the, in the Andy Warhol sale was all the educational programming that we had done um, and, and, and marketing and content that we produced. So we, Christie's made a really beautiful video um, explaining the project, interviewing Gil, the director of the Herring Foundation. Um, that worked out really well. So again, we're really trying to blend the gap between, um, bridge the gap between traditional art collectors and um, exclusively Web3. Um, collectors so I think this is a really great project to do that um, that we're continuing to do with the with the Warhol um, and then to your last question um, you'll have to wait and see Ooh, okay okay so you're so you're saying there's a chance <laughs> saying there's a chance I really love to see it one thing I'd love to get your perspective on as well and I know that the, that Christie's does this and in, in, you know has has a lot of experience doing this in, in other contexts as well is what are the kind of the unique challenges or also opportunities of doing like a posthumous sale like this you know like and, and especially with like the digital context you know be doing right by the legacy working with a foundation versus a living artist just curious to hear your perspective there yeah, well, I will say it's relatively new that Chris, that auction houses in general will even work like primary with primary market stuff, whether that be posthumously with a foundation or whether that be, you know, directly from an artist. Like we've worked with ZK. I mean, typically we, Chris, you know, all auction houses sell art on behalf of one, you know, owner to the next owner. Um, very rarely will artists sell their, sell new work for the first time through an auction house. Um, so the consignment process is very different. What the what the seller, in this case the artist or the foundation, cares about, um, is is very different than uh, what you know an owner who just owns a Picasso and wants to sell a Picasso would care about. Um, so that's been a learning curve in the past you know three almost three years for us internally. Um, both from, from my perspective that we actually, the, from the client, people who talk to the clients, but also internally from our marketing team and our you know, accounting teams and our finance teams. And it's just, it's a completely different sort of um, way of working with, with clients, which I, I love. I think it's great. Um, it's a lot more about telling the story. Uh, it's a lot more about, um, yeah, I guess the narrative around why, why now, why this, I think is important to tell. Whereas if you're just selling, for example, a Picasso from someone that owns a Picasso, it's less about why are you selling this Picasso? Like, oh my gosh, why, why did you make this? That's not really the conversation, right? It's like this, no one really cares why the guy wants to sell this Picasso. <laughs> like it's just on the market. Um, so it's a, it's a bit different from the storytelling aspect, which is, I think has been exciting. Wow, amazing, amazing. Well, look, I do think we are out of time, unfortunately. Give it up for our incredible panelists. This was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.